not detected. So the antibiogram was the baby was empirically started on injection piperacillin tazobactam plus vancomycin. Initially, we give uh, piperacillin tazobactam for two days. Once the blood culture has shown the uh, staph MSSA, we made into floxacillin and we continued vancomycin. So vancomycin we have because of severe infection. Rifampicin was added because to augment the uh, vancomycin activity. So the studies has been shown like the vancomycin was diffused into the bone marrow poorly when ischemia is present. So whenever there is a severe osteomyelitis, there will be necrosis and there will be bone ischemia will be there. So the penetration of vancomycin is very less. And if we added rifampicin, because rifampicin will enhance the activity of vancomycin against the Staphylococcus aureus and it's able to penetrate the uh, cells like bone. So that's why we added continued vancomycin uh, with the rifampicin. Totally, we have given 10 days of cloxacillin and we changed it to oral clocks on, uh, for 18 days. And vancomycin, rifampicin given for, uh, IV vancomycin was given for 20 days. Almost four weeks were given of IV and we discharged it with oral clocks and linezolid. So for two weeks. Uh, IV plus oral will combine, uh, will be given as total of six weeks of antibiotics. So with the la, uh, with the summary, so baby had issues like acute separative separative parotitis with the pseudo paralysis of both limbs. So with that impression, we have uh, our investigation like X-ray showing severe bone destruction, ultrasound was showing soft tissue collection, and arthrotomy was the pus drained from the metaphyseal region of the bone. So with this control like multifocal osteomyelitis with the septic arthritis. So it's involving the bilateral shoulder joint with this left, left is more involved than the right and with the right side temporomandibular joint. So with right parotid abscess. So this is our uh, conclusion like of the baby. And uh, so this is a two month of the, uh, like two months. Baby had, you can see the x-ray and the right side is still, uh, right side is open. Right side of the upper limb was okay, but the left side the moment is was comparatively it's reduced. So X-ray was showing uh, some uh, lytic lesions still present in the both the side. And if you see in the at one year of age, we followed up and if the baby had a very good activity, like uh, it was more uh, abduction, adduction of the both the shoulder joint was normal. Like a left side was moving, uh, was normal and right side also moving, uh, power tone and everything was normal. X-ray was showing there is no lytic lesions and the humerus has been well formed. There's a newborn formation also present. So what is unusual with the person or this baby? As baby had a clinical manifestation at second to third week of life, so it uh, usually uh, the, the disease may be started at the first week of life itself. So which is usually unusual. Also, baby had no joint symptoms like erythema, joint swelling. There's no pain, and nothing was there, and only some vague systemic signs like uh, some mild irritability, and there is no life-threatening events occurring in the pre and post surgery. So baby also had a least joint to be involved. That is the shoulder joint will be the least joint. So when baby had no joint sequelae, even the humeral head was lysed. So even the baby had a severe bone destruction, the baby had no joint sequelae because of appropriate treatment at the appropriate time. So with the discussion, I want to discuss about the, my uh, septic arthritis as well as osteomyelitis. The septic arthritis is an immune that's defined as the inflammation of the synovial membrane with prolonged effusion into the joint capsule due to separative infection of a joint. It's one of the deep seated infection in units. It's 0.3 per 1,000 live births, whereas in India, it has been reported as 0.6 per 1,000 live births. So due to paucity of signs and symptoms, neonatal septic catheters often goes unrecognized at the beginning with the potential to cause devastating complications, including death, death of the newborn. If you see osteomyelitis, it's an infection and inflammation of the bone and bone marrow. And it's an infection, usually painful inflammatory disease of the bone, often a bacterial origin that may result in death of a bone tissue. So why actually acute osteomyelitis and septic arthritis uh, can, can cause it at, uh, at, uh, always? Because the vascular anatomy was that like, like a metaphyseal vessels communicate with the epiphyseal vessels in the cartilaginous precursor of the ossific. So that facilitate the rapid spread of infection from the metaphysis to the epiphysis. So, which makes the vascular anatomy like both uh, acute osteomyelitis and septic uh, arthritis can often occur coexist, and it's difficult to distinguish from each other. Uh, uh, literature says almost seventy-six percent of all cases as a result of this unique vascular anatomy of uh, vessels. So, both can occur in uh, coexist. The infection can spread like primary or secondary. The secondary is the most common. Secondary hematogenic infection seeding of infectious organisms are more common than compared to direct inoculation or extension of from contagious focus. 
so why synovial space or joint is most vulnerable for seeding infection of organisms because it lacks a basement membrane and moreover neonates or uh, synovial has more increased blood supply and vascular region origin so it leads to the high chance for seeding of infectious organisms so the pathophysiology first i'm dealing with septic arthritis so this uh, picture showing a normal joint with the articular space so once the bacteria like Staphylococcus aureus has inoculated the joint, it produces the uh, protease like enzymes like chondrocyte proteases, which digests the collagen within most probably within, within 80, uh, 8 hours. And like uh, for if once the bacteria has started to produce like pathogen associated molecular patterns like PAMPs. So with that, uh, our, uh, our immune system think it has foreign anything and immunity response will be elicited. The, the, pump, the bacteria will be phagocyte by the macrophages and it releases pro-inflammatory cytokines, which is interleukin 1 and TNF alpha. And these interleukin are like TNF alpha will, uh, will attract so many chemokines and uh, like an, uh, other chemoattractants and will start to produ uh, produce like uh, histamines and those things, which leads to increased vasodilatation and vascular permeability. So, which ultimately leads to red, uh, red disc discoloration, swell and warm, and the typical presentation of cystic arthritis. So the inflammatory response will lead to fluid accumulate in the joint space that will increase intra-articular pressures. This pressure will compress the blood vessels and followed by at last there will be necrosis of affected bones and cartilage. So that will be joint destruction will be present in the septic arthritis. Finally, we will start with effusion and we will finish with the destruction. So uh, this, this is the uh, physiology like uh, uh, this is a bone which is having diaphysis, physis and epiphysis. You can see the um, that uh, articular articular uh, uh, arteriolar sharp corners. So it like uh, the vessels being uh, having a sharp corner, which makes the blood flow to be sluggish. So this sluggish blood flow will uh, leads to accumulation of the infections. Bacteria and those things will start to accumulate, and it leads to the nidus for the infection. And there is a vessels called transphysial vessels, which you can see from the picture C. It will go to the growth plate. So if the infection grows to the transphysial vessels it can lead to the affect the growth plate and will ultimately lead to the joint sequelae. So this is a uh, basic pathophysiology of osteomyelitis. So once bacteria set infection at the metaphysis, there will be formation of abscess. This abscess formation will rupture. It can go to either two ways. First is it can rupture into the joint space and cause septic arthritis. And or else the abscess can rupture and it, uh, it can lead to periosteal abscess. Because the periosteum is a loose connective tissue, it can lead to periosteal abscess as well as subcutaneous abscess. This is the pathophysiology of osteomyelitis. Joint the joint presentation will be that the reduced movement of the affected limb, which is the most common presentation uh, uh, for the uh, most common joint presentation. It's called pseudo paralysis. Then the crying immediately on handling the affected limbs, or there will be swelling of the affected joint or there will be erythema of overlying skin of the affected joint and there will be increased temperature of the affected limb. Like uh, then uh, uh, the systemic signs like lethargy, irritability, refusal to feed, inconsolable cry, hyper or hypothermia or the often vague systemic signs which can be there or plus or minus. Sometimes baby when you start putting a diaper that can also lead to a uh, pain in the lower limbs. So that can be elicited. And predisposing factors like prematurity, low birth weight, intrauterine infections like syphilis, torch, and peripartum gender tract infection of the mother. It's most, UTA is the most important thing and uh, difficult labor and comorbid conditions like neonatal sepsis, birth asphyxia, and postnatal interventions like intravenous lines. And umbilical catheterization can uh, act as like a septic emboli, which leads to the osteomyelitis, and which we usually uh, practice in our NICU, like we pick a heel prick for RBS, which can uh, nidus infection for calcaneal osteomyelitis. So these are the predisposing factors for the osteomyelitis. So the causative organism for both the septic and osteomyelitis are the important thing is Staphylococcus aureus. So which is most common the worldwide as well as in India. Then it's a Klebsiella pneumonia followed by group B streptococci, then followed by hysteria coli and enterobacter species, Kingella kingi and Candida species. So Staphylococcus aureus is the most common bacteria affecting uh, osteomyelitis and septic arthritis. Laboratory markers, which are usually be in a, not like a specific markers, like all like a complete blood count showing a TLC of more than 20,000 blood culture and sensitivity and inflammatory markers like CRP, which has high value, 
of more than if it's if it's more than 20 milligram per liter and pro calcitonin so there is all, there is no specific marker which has been uh, pointing towards the osteomyelitis so if we come to investigation like x-ray if you see a neonatal osteomyelitis neonates often shows bone destruction much earlier in the process than the older children and the radiographic abnormality is generally apparent by 7 to 10 days after the onset of infection. The first abnormality is spilling of the soft tissues surrounding the bone site of infection. And if the later things are like uh, necrosis and uh, if, it's, if, the if the infection is spreading to the joint, there will be articular spilling and widening of the joint space may be seen. So if it, if it involves a joint. So it's a, it is, this is called uh, this x-ray of uh, septic arthritis. Like uh, there will be narrowing of joint space, irregularity of the subchondral bone, the, uh, there will be joint space loss, and there will be subchondral erosions and sclerosis of the femoral head, and ultimately lead to the osteonecrosis and complete collapse of the joint. So this is the actual fi uh, findings of the uh, septic arthritis. Now it's uh, ultrasound of the the elevated periosteum will be there. And second thing is sub, uh, some sub, sometimes subperiosteal collections will be there and soft tissue abscess will be there and there will be fluid collections also will be there. So these three, three are the findings we can able to elicit on the osteomyelitis case by the ultrasound. If you want to pick up a septic catheters by ultrasound, thing is there will be only thing, the thing is joint effusion. So the effusion is what? It's a widening of space between a capsule and the bone of more than 2 millimeter, which indicates the effusion. If it is echo free, it can be due to the transient synovitis. But if it is echogenic, it's probably pointing towards a septic arthritis. So it's a, this uh, effusion is the main thing which can be predicted towards the joint uh, of septic arthritis. So if you if then you go with MRI for osteomyelitis, the first T1 will be showing intensity. T1 will be showing in the low signal intensity medullary space. And T2 will be showing uh, inflammatory process like high signal intensity will be there and edema will be there and gadolinium, gadolinium will be enhances the areas of necrosis. So this is the MRI finding of which is usually an, uh, uh, comparatively better than the CT. It's the MRI finding of the osteomyelitis. If you see for the MRI finding of septic arthritis, there will be a low signal within the subcontal bone and there will be high, like high signal perisinovale and periarticular edema will be there. And there will be a post contrast synovial enhancement will be there. So the and it's more sensitive to detect the early cartilage damage and bone destructions. So predominantly involves a periarticular synovial thing will be there in the septic arthritis. And uh, for treatment, like for the natal osteomyelitis, empirical antibiotics like injection oxacillin and gentamicin will be added. And vancomycin should be considered if MRSA is suspected. When your NICU has more than 10 percentage of MRSA, then vancomycin should be added and followed by it can be tailored according to our culture and sensitivity. But the total duration of antibody therapy sh should be at least four to six weeks and the entire course should be administered by the intravenous route alone. And that's a preferred thing which has been showing by the literatures. If you want, uh, there are, uh, if you want, if we have the pure neuroseptic neuro arthritis, then the empirical antibiotics will be first generation keplosporins and vancomycin or cefotaxin. And the antibiotic therapy should be modified according to the culture and sensitivity. And the IV antibiotics, literature has been saying like two weeks of IV antibiotics and four will be two to oral uh, antibiotics of two to four weeks. Totally, it should be at least four to six weeks of antibiotics will be should be there. And Clohati has been uh, prescribing like of three weeks of antibiotics. So just a few sample series has been for the septic arthritis of the Indian perspective. So they were saying like in septic arthritis, male to female ratio uh, has been as more predominant, male has more, more, more thing and uh, and birth weight, like if preterm has affected more, has been 23 plus 23 babies has been affected in the study and compared to the term or post and because preterm has relatively immunocompetent. So that's why they are occurring more uh, chances of infection and the age of onset of illness actually under in the 15.7 days, second week or second to third week of life. And there will be history of a previous intravenous cannulation in the affected limb, or there will be an uh, uh, like uh, uh, there will be an umbilical catheterization, or there will be ventilator support will be there. So these uh, severe risk factors will be there to cause an septic arthritis. And they have studied uh, with compared with other studies. So with the septic arthritis usually seen in the uh, hip joint, in the comparatively, so that's the most joint is uh, frequently was hip joint, and the femur bone is the most bone to be involved. 
compare uh, uh, next come the knee joints and the main age of onset is like say so like say so third week of life is the third to fourth week of li life is the like a mean uh, days which has been started clinical manus manus started to appear so then uh, there is a screening tool for neural septic arthritis so there is a block a and block b in block a that will be uh, first one is systemic signs and symptoms of infection should be there second is joint signs like erythema joint swelling and symptoms of inflammation in block b uh, first one is a positive septic screen or growth of microorganisms on blood culture or afflicted joint fluid examination demonstrate pus cells under microscopy or afflicted joint fluid culture shows growth of the culprit organisms or the evidence of septic arthritis upon radio imaging of afflicted joints it, it, it like if the, in the block a the two should be present and block b one should be present that fits the criteria or in one uh, one thing should be present in the block a and at least three things should be present in the block b so this is a screening tool for the septic arthritis so if you delay the treatment of septic arthritis in the new net uh, there will be a recovery rate will be actually it's different so if you see like a most and you, and you, in the hip joint uh, it's a least like a recovery rate is more 33.3 uh, percentage is there but if you compare it to knee ankle shoulder elbow and other joints the recovery data seems to be normal it seems to be okay so if you delay the treatment especially on the hip joint so it's a sequelae will be more comparatively other uh, other joints so the, that has to be thing a delay in the detection and institution of appropriate management significantly increases the risk of joint sequels in a neural septic arthritis and detection of joint pathology with ultrasound at initial presentation of illness predicts the unfavorable outcome so if you are able to see any effusion in the ultrasound at the initial period of admission that means so it's most like uh, it's kind of an unfavorable outcome in the neural septic arthritis so you know, how much, like how long we can should be follow up so the follow up cohort usually uh, like uh, people are saying like literature say 12 months observation is too much so to follow up like our baby so the joints usually on the follow up you should uh, uh, you should follow up uh, like for the limb length discrepancy any restricted range of movement is there any joint stiffness is there or like any joint subluxation is there so these things has to be followed up and be noticed at. and and should be if there, if there is any sequelae that appropriate management has to be started so the final take home points like um, that the strong clinical suspense should be there as there are paucity of symptoms of the septic arthritis as well as osteomyelitis the pseudo paralysis is the most commonest symptom which can be occur in that and uh, if you start a earlier treatment the good prognosis will be that irrespective of the bone destructions so as our baby almost had lies of you know, head of the humerus still the baby had been now there is no joint sequelae it's because of the appropriate treatment at the appropriate time so the treatment of should be for osteomyelitis at least iv antibiotics must it should be given for at least 4 to 6 weeks and follow up should be there for at least for 12 months so these are my take home take home points for the septic arthritis and uh, osteomyelitis so thank you thank you prakash so we uh, presented this case because uh, even though we know that osteomyelitis is a non non complication of staphylococcal infection it is actually a not so common complication so in this case also we actually didn't expect an osteomyelitis uh, because uh, uh, we the baby had uh, my baby was actually not toxic uh, and the, uh, there was no local findings of septic arthritis at presentation like the shoulders were looking uh, normally there was no erythema and there was a, uh, there was actually asymmetry of movements on both upper limbs so we initially felt like whether one limb is normal and other is not moving well and uh, is it a uh, initial brachial plexus injury which is um, get missed initially but uh, then the mother showed us a video of a, a baby moving both upper limbs in the initial days uh, so we were sure that uh, it was a late onset uh, uh, positive of movements so uh, initially uh, done an ultrasound but the effusion was uh, not there and uh, then because of the edema in the humeral area we actually took the x ray and uh, uh, there was one question uh, in the group like is mri required for all cases of septic arthritis actually we are not doing mri for all cases i don't think it is indicated for all cases but on seeing the uh, x ray just because there was a lytic lesions uh, uh, and there was apparently bone destruction in the humerus 
uh, suspected an uh, uh, severe infection like an osteomyelitis, and then uh, MRI was done as an emergency. And actually, the baby was planned for surgery at the night itself because of after seeing the MRI because of, of that emergency situation because it was a totally destructive uh, uh, process in the MRI. And the temporomandibular joint was also involved uh, like that. Then uh, primary immunodeficiency, any workup, we have actually not done at the initial period because uh, at that time, uh, except for the uh, genetic studies uh, uh, or like exome like sequencing, I, uh, the other uh, findings were not uh, suggestive of a particular uh, uh, immunodeficiency. We can uh, pinpoint any particular immunodeficiency. So we thought like uh, uh, we will follow up the case and if, uh, we discussed with the genetist also and we uh, thought like if some other infections come through the way, then we will uh, uh, make them to do the primary immunodeficiency work because it was expensive also and they were not affording at that time. But uh, till now, it's a baby is almost a year and uh, baby not uh, is uh, not having any significant infection, any other infection and growth is also adequate. Uh, any other uh, uh, any uh, other experiences from the uh, similar uh, clinical situation? So, uh, so uh, the take home message is like uh, even though, so we also had a twenty four hour delay in uh, diagnosing the case of an osteomyelitis because we were also not expecting the same. So we, we just presented this to highlight that even osteomyelitis can occur in the second week of life. We were actually, when reading through the literature, it is rare, rare to present osteomyelitis in the uh, first week. That is when it is presenting radiologically in the second week means it has started in the first week. So it is very unlikely to start in the first week, but that also can happen. Uh, so uh, any case of a positive movements in the initial uh, first week, even without any signs of uh, uh, inflammation. We should think of this condition because we are a little bit reluctant to take x-rays of the joints in the newborn. We uh, follow ultrasound usually, but uh, that is also uh, important in uh, some cases. Uh, any other comments? Uh, if no further comments, shall we uh, close the session then? Madam? Parotid swelling also, Prakash, something about parotid swelling. Also. Indication for a surgical explosion, like if you see a, like a severe bone destructions in the uh, in the X-rays, and if the baby is like uh, having a uh, baby's into shock, and baby's like very uh, baby's like not had a shock and very uh, not toxic looking, then there has been literature showing a literature saying like this indication for surgical exploration immediately. So. Um, uh, that's the actually that in, otherwise we can there's not much of surgical exploration not required if the if the unless there's a severe distortion is there in the x-ray or in MRI. Need for adding uh, cloxacillin when mango and rifampicin was started. Actually, uh, uh, the after start, we actually started vancomycin initially, and then uh, when we suspected a joint infection, we added rifampicin. You are but not I, audible. Uh, is it okay now? Is it okay, madam? Now I am I audible? Yes, you are audible. You are audible, ma'am. Okay. So actually, we started with the vancomycin and rifampicin uh, uh, after one day. And then uh, uh, after uh, starting this, only the culture came, blood culture came as uh, a uh, cloxacillin sensitive uh, staphylococcus. But still, because by that time the baby had a severe infection, we actually, uh, we are now a little bit reluctant to stop vancomycin because uh, even though they told it is an MSSA, we are, uh, we just plan to continue vancomycin till the other culture report came. Then we, when we go, when through the literature, uh, they are also saying like, uh, can continue both if a uh, high chance of MRSA is suspected. But for uh, but the, for this baby, actually, uh, the result came as M MSSA only from the uh, uh, pus culture also. But we just because the baby was uh, very sick, we just continued both. Yeah. 
but uh, and uh, cloxacil in IV actually IV access is also very difficult. So it was uh, uh, missing in between, and uh, finally we have to for a uh, uh, UV cut down uh, for a continuing cloxacil. And uh, we could actually we stopped cloxacillin after a few days of IV and shifted to oral because of the um, problem with IV line. Any other comments? Very well worked up case, Gene uh, SAT. So recently we had a case of uh, septic arthritis uh, who was referred to us and uh, the diagnosis of septic arthritis was missed from the referring hospital. And uh, now we came to know that the parents have put up a case against the referring hospital. Uh, soon after admission, we got the, uh, we could uh, do uh, drainage, but uh, there was no delay from our part. But unfortunately, uh, they have uh, sued against the referring hospital saying that there was delay in diagnosis. So I think this is also medical legal um, of medical legal importance, I think. Yes. For our luck, actually, baby uh, he escaped the sequelae. But mm. we were also worried about the 24 hour delay from our part in diagnosing osteomyelitis because of surgery. Because um, many times, practically, we don't uh, see the effusion in ultrasound. So, even though clinically we, we may suspect uh, septic arthritis, the ultrasound uh, diagnosis may not be very fast. So, uh, shall we wind up the session, madam? Yes, this is a good presentation. Uh, thank you, Prakash, and uh, thank you for moderating. So, thank you all for uh, hearing the session.